Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yep, we can hear. So, you. I'm really happy to show some new results on the ion neutral connection in dense cores. This is work that uh, I've carried out here at the Max Planck Institute for Theoretical Physics in Garching uh, with collaborators Anika Schmidek and Paula Caselli, but also collaborators elsewhere like Steve Staller, Dave Freyer, Sarah Church, and Andrew Harris. So, if we go back to the, the uh, the sketch of star formation that we've seen previously in some of the other talks, we can, we can think that uh, molecular clouds, they start to fragment and they start to form dense structures called dense cores, uh, something like uh, what Samantha was uh, mentioning right, right before me. So in this case, these dense cores, they are very cold and dense. It's the right places to generate a lot of uh, chemistry, but also it's the place where uh, everything is very quiescent, and it's ready to form stars. At some point, this, this dense course will undergo gravitational collapse. And we, at, at the end, we hope to form a star and a, and, and a protoplanetary disk, which will then be the initial conditions for the planetary systems. So if we want to understand the star formation process, really what we need to, uh, some of the key properties that we need to understand are the turbulence and the magnetic field. So the turbulence is, is important both for setting up the initial conditions, but also to, to provide support to the dense core. While magnetic field, it is crucial to understand what is going on with the, uh, with the disk formation processes. And the interplay between these two are really the, some of the key important processes for uh, regulating star and disk formation and evolution. So in the case of the magnetic field, the, the main role that they play can be summarized by this sketch. So in this sketch, I show uh, a spherical dense core that has a radial density profile that gets denser towards the center. And on top of this spherical cow, we also have magnetic field uh, lines that we can see that just, they're just threading through the dense core. If we let the, the dense core collapse, then we start to see that the, the dense core itself gets denser, especially in the central regions, but also the magnetic field lines, they get dragged by the material. So that means that they, they help to generate this hourglass uh, morphology for the magnetic field that has been seen and has been looked for uh, in, in polarization observations. The important part is that if we have this magnetic field that is being dragged, it's being dragged by the ions. So in this case, the neutrals, they don't notice this and they just keep flowing without caring about the B field. However, the ions are held by the magnetic field and therefore the ions and the neutrals start to have a different kinematics. So this is the ambipolar diffusion process. And in this case, what it implies that if we look at ions and neutrals, then the ions should present narrower line widths if we see along the line of sight because they overall they have less motions than the neutrals. So then the role of turbulence, it's, it's similar in a way. So if we have this plot of the amount of energy injected into the system and how, how it dis it's distributed throughout different scales, so we can see that in the left hand side, we have large scales, that those are the scales where the energy of the turbulence is, is injected. And it is injected at large energy, sometimes means large line widths. So once we start to go down this, uh, this uh, cascade of the turbulence, then we start to see less and less uh, energy or smaller and smaller line widths at smaller scales that are being probed. At some point, we also expect to see uh, a scale at which the dissipation process is much more important. And then the energy is dissipated and therefore we don't have this cascade anymore. And then we see this kind of cut off. So this can be summarized as there is less energy present at smaller scales, which is similar to Larson's relation. And in this case, we, we can observationally say that higher density tracers should present narrower line widths. So in this case, this is uh, without uh, 
without uh, feedback from the from the product stars. So if we just have a, a, a quiescent system and we just try to probe higher densities, then they should have narrower line widths. So how do we test the polar diffusion in this case? We can go back to this kind of plot, this sketch from Lee and Hood in 2008, which shows how the line width as a function of scale for ions and neutrals. So the ions are shown in red, the, the blue curve shows the expected curve for the neutrals. And you can see that in the left-hand side at large scales, neutrals and ions, they behave the same way. They, they show more or less the same line width and they follow the, the cascade of, uh, of turbulence. However, at some point, the ions and neutrals, they are, they are decoupled. And it is at this point where we start to see that the ions, they are not, they're not moving at the same velocities as neutrals. So in this case, we could see that the ions have narrower line widths than neutrals. So if we're able to measure the difference between ions and neutrals, we should be able to put some constraints on the ambipolar diffusion process. And that's important because ambipolar diffusion is one of the uh, first, uh, first mechanisms that are putting in MHD simulations to properly treat the role of magnetic fields into the star and, and disk formation process. So if we don't know uh, what's going on inside the core, it is very hard to know how to form the disks. So if we're gonna test this, then we can say, okay, let's take a look at the dense core and we pick an ion neutral pair that is observed at a, at a sufficient sensitivity and angular resolution, but also spectral resolution that is also crucial. So as a test, we're just gonna take a look at this, uh, at this object that is called Barnard 5. And the image that I show in the left is the velocity dispersion map that we have obtained uh, from observing ammonia with the GBT. So what you can see within the orange contour is the dense core, the quiescent dense core. So it has a very narrow line width. Outside the dense core, we can see the very turbulent surrounding cloud. So in this case, we see that there's a very sharp transition between dense core and cloud, and we can clearly identify, okay, the central part is quiescent. So, however, th there, is a, there is an issue. We don't have sufficient angular resolution to really the, uh, study the structure within with, with this observation. So that's why we go to observations like uh, um, GBT plus VLA. And then we have observations like this that are actually able to reveal the substructure within. So instead of a, a normal blob, now we have filaments and we have fragments of the filaments and we have another fragmentation of a clump all within this single region. So this is observation, these are observations with ammonia and the GBT plus the VLA. This is a neural and this has very good angular resolution and a spectral resolution and sensitivity. So it will allow us to have already the neutrals, uh, the neutral observations. So now if we're going to observe this region in an ion, so then we observe N2H plus, which is the perfect match to compare. So in the left-hand side, the blue, the blue hues are, are showing the integrated intensity maps uh, for N2H plus one to zero observed with GBT Argus. So this took, uh, uh, like, uh, I think about 16 hours to observe, and we were able to, to get this very nice map of Twitch Plus. In the middle panel, ammonia 11, and you can see that the, the integrated intensity maps, they look similar, and also we added some markers so you can do a, a cross check between different structures. So although they, it looks relatively similar, there are some differences, but they're minor. They're, they're more or less covering the same area. The emission is extended in, uh, they have a similar extent and the structures are similar. So we think that they're tracing similar structures. So it's a fair comparison. In this case, the ion is a slightly higher density tracer than ammonia. So in this case, if we put together that the ions is also the higher density tracer, we expect the line weights from the ion to be narrower than ammonia. 
So for all of for all of the pixels in these maps, we're able to get very good kinematical information. So in this case, we get the velocity and center velocity maps. And that's what I show here. In the left hand side, we have the velocity dispersion obtained from N2H plus. In the right hand side, we have the velocity dispersion obtained from ammonia. So we have ions on the left, neutrals on the right. They are shown in the same color scale. So in this case, what if you just take a look at the left, they already show that it's a bit lighter in color than the right hand side. So that means that the, the ions, they show slightly broader line widths than the neutrals. So if we take a look at the ratio map of these two quantities, we can see if this is a global quantity, if it is really far off from unity, if we're within one, it should be okay. But the ratio map between, uh, between the neutral over the, over the ion, it is very red in this, in this color scheme. That means that the neutrals are quite narrower they're much more narrower than than expected if we try to do a comparison of the whole population of the pixels that we can compare in the in, in the map and since we have a good estimate of the temperature from ammonia then we can estimate the sonic Mach number and that's the real physical quantity that's important to compare so if we take a look at ammonia in, it's the it's the blue curve and that gives us a, a Mach number a typical Mach number of about half well, in the case of the ion, we get that Mach number of about 0.6. So that's about 20% higher. So they are very, they're quite subsonic, but they are not the same. And if we compare pixel by pixel, the relationship between the, the, uh, the non-thermal component of the line width between the ion in the y-axis and the neutral in the x-axis, and we just do a KDE analysis, it's shown, it's clearly shown in this figure that it's offset from the one-to-one -one correlation by a, a substantial amount. Oh, so in this case, perfect. So now how do we interpret this? So in summary, we have that the ion, which is the higher density tracer, shows a broader line width than the neutral counterpart, which is a slightly lower density tracer. So this sounds like an inverse and bipolar diffusion process. And maybe this could be a good evidence for penetration by MHD waves inside the dense core. What do I mean by that? So if we go back to the sketch of the spherical dense core threaded by the, by the um, uh, by magnetic field, then if we have all of this core embedded in a supersonic molecular cloud where we have supersonic turbulence, then we could have MHD waves, alpha waves, that are hitting the core at any given moment. So this wave is going to hit the core and is going to um, be able to transmit a little bit of the, uh, a fraction of the energy in that wave. That perturbation actually, since it's an alpha wave, it will perturb the magnetic field inside the core. So that means that if we move the, if we wave around the magnetic field lines and the ions are, are well uh, are well attached to their uh, magnetic field lines, then we're actually steering the ions more than the neutrals. And similarly, we can do, we can get a very good estimate of the magnetic field perturbation by this wave from the line widths and the density of the, of the material that we're probing. In this case, we have an estimate of about 30 microgauss. That is a substantial amount. That is, comp that is a, uh, it's a, about a fifth of what we expect is the maximum value of, uh, of the magnetic field inside the dense core. So that's substantial. And it's completely opposite to what we were expecting. So in summary, these are, we're showing the first result comparisons of ion and neutrals in, the, in a low mass dense core. And we're showing that the neutrals show narrower line widths. The magnetic fields inside the dense cores are therefore not static. The perturbation of the field is substantial. However, for the analysis, it is crucial to have a very good image fidelity for, for the analysis and also very good spectral solution. Therefore, this is optimal for single dish. Also, we can try to catch different ion, ion neutral pairs that could be used to study the wave penetration 
as a function of density. And that is really uh, important to understand how is the um, dissipation of the wave inside. And that is also important to know what's going to happen with the magnetic field within the dense core as a function of density. This gives us a new window to study magnetic fields within dense cores in a bit indirect ways, not absolutely direct as in other mechanisms. But this is, this is quite interesting because it allows us to use chemistry to highlight different regions. And as long as we're able to find the right pair, we could continue to do something like this in, in different places. And Argos 144 will allow us to do studies like this for more regions, larger areas, to try to see if this is a, uh, what, what happens in, in a lower density environment, but also in different lines. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jaime. Our first question is, are there systematic differences between the line of sight velocities of ammonia and NH2 or N2H plus, for example, the drift velocity? So in this case, we're, we're able to calculate the difference in velocity between the two uh, species. And the, uh, there, is a, there is a difference, but it's not a systematic difference throughout the region. So there are regions in the, within the, this, uh, this area where we see clearly one, one species is bluer than the other, while the other is a bit redder. But it is, it's not as clear cut as what we see in the velocity dispersion. Another question I have, and I think you get at it in the last point of your summary here, is for your work, is it more important to do other lines or other cores or go deeper um, for individual maps here? It's sort of in this discussion of wider or deeper. Yeah. So in this case, uh, so if we go to these, if we go here, the, the map that we have here it's about six arc minutes in, in, in height. And I th it, this is one of the big ones. So I think that we don't need to go very wide. We just need to go a lot deeper in, for, for, some of the, for some of the other lines. So some of the other lines that we would like to use are like N2D+, uh, data-related ammonia, and they, they are also a very nice pair. We could also try to go to slightly lower density traces, but that's also a bit difficult. And in this case, it's interesting that we don't see a clear correlation um, with uh, the position on the map. So with this difference in, in the velocity expression is not just at the position of the protostar or at the position of the filament. It's throughout the region. So that's why it, it was something surprising for us. And that's why angular resolution was key, because we had lower resolution data for which we saw this difference, but we couldn't identify if that difference was real or if it was due to substructure in the, in the emission. Our next question is, what assumptions do you make to calculate variation in the B field? So this is basically, um, going back to some of the equations in the uh, Stanley and Pallas book where you have MHD waves and it just takes, it takes a look at the, um, at the ion, at the ion fraction. We also estimate that the ions that are well, uh, the, the perturbation of the wave of the, of the velocities in the ions is uh, proportional to the velocity dispersion of the ions. That, that's a weak approximation, it's not so strong. The most important approximation is, is, is how we estimate the, the electric fraction, but in this case, we, we have two extremes uh, from McKee 89 and, and Caselli 2002, and those, those numbers give us a, a, a bound, like a extreme for the magnetic field perturbation. Two more questions. There's some star formation in this core. If N2H plus probes denser gas, it will also probe regions closer to the star formation process. Could this affect your conclusions? Very, very good question. So in this case, this is a big region, it's a big core, but it has only one protostar. And that is marked here at the center. So that was one of the issues. If we do the comparison of the velocity dispersion, that's that is where the protostar is, and it's the, it's the only place that we are 
and of uh, worried about a protocellular feedback. Elsewhere, that, that is completely unaffected. This is a class one. We see the outflow clear, and we don't see a very, very clear correlation with, with star formation rate in this region. Um, final question, and then there's a comment that I would encourage people to read. Uh, would you, however, not expect contraction motions to affect the densest part and therefore expect N2H plus to have a larger line width? Mm -hmm. So we, we, were, we were looking at that, and that's why we needed the higher resolution maps. So in this case, the, if the difference in velocity dispersion were only at the highest column density places in the filaments, we would have completely gone for that interpretation. However, we see this difference in line width, even in the, in the, in the low, den, low column density part of the core. So that's why uh, we, we, don't, we, we don't think that this is due to uh, gravitational contraction. Um, however, in this case, at the tip of the north-south filament, where we have this marker, you can see that it looks a bit bluer. And that is the region in the filament where we think it's, it's either contracting or it's very close to, and that's one of the, the, the places where the contraction is also seen, is possibly seen in, in ammonia. Thank you, Jaime, for some very nice work.